this month, we'll be looking across the five regions um, for, you know, for what's been happening, what's impacting, but also in, in particular and where relevant at Afghanistan and how the developments of the Taliban there are impacting on science um, you know, in, in the region. So to begin with, let me hand over to Joel Adriano, our Regional Coordinator for Asia Pacific. Over to you, Joel. Okay. Uh, it's good afternoon here in Manila, where I'm based, uh, where the regional office of the Asia Pacific is based. Um, so, uh, as the uh, as the description says, Asia Pacific, the, this practically uh, involves the entire uh, Southeast uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the uh, seeds or the small islands in in the Pacifics. Um, and there are various concerns uh, uh, that that is involved within our sub-region because uh, you can actually divide Asia Pacific into three main areas, as I mentioned. So there are concerns that mostly involve uh, South Asia. There are also concerns that mostly involve uh, Southeast Asia, and obviously a lot of the rising seas climate change concerns uh, and fisheries are within the small island states. And, but there are general uh, issues that uh, uh, is of, a, of a trending, kind of trending within the region. Uh, the main concern, of course, is uh, involves COVID. So there's now a surge. So you had the surge with China, and then you had the sur big surge in, in, um, uh, in the US and then in Europe, and then Latin America. Uh, for, for one whole year, it seems that uh, Asia, specifically Southeast Asia, have managed to avoid the wars of COVID. But then come February, that's when you saw that, that there's a surge in India, and then there's an ongoing surge in Southeast Asia. And practically every country here now, uh, there's a surge even in in developed countries like uh, Singapore, uh, Australia, and and prob probably the only one who who managed to escape is um, New Zealand because they already panicking with one case the other the other day and they have to shut down an, an entire community. And uh, the other topic would be on climate change, of course, uh, and then. Uh, uh, consequently, on rising seas, uh, there's also a big concern right now with um, censorship and freedom, and then uh, water issues, cities uh, congestions and pollution, and of course education because a lot of uh, Asian countries really do give high premium on education, and because because of traditional uh, way of thinking here that. The only way you could go up or or get out of poverty is through a very good education, and that's why high grades is highly valued. Uh, and now, because of the, the situation in Afghanistan, there's a big concern among, especially among the uh, neighboring countries in uh, uh, in Afghanistan, particularly in India, because they're kind of worried that the uh, the situation might spill over in India. Uh, and also that uh, a, big, uh, a big issue that will impact on science right now is the possible brain drain. Because a lot of scientists now uh, are moving out. In fact, the ones who are still there in Afghanistan have, uh, have uh, giving out emails, asking for help if they can get out of the country. Some are trapped somewhere in the countryside, in rural areas. And so a lot of um, uh, European countries and the US are trying to figure out how could they help these scientists, researchers, uh, academicians who are stuck in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, it will be a huge brain drain. The 20 years, uh, a progress that they have made possibly everybody will go out there and of course that will be a, a gain for a lot of these countries who will get it will be getting all these talents and 
considering that Taliban, they're kind of notorious as a, for being anti-science. So they will target a lot of uh, uh, those also from the universities, a lot of the professors there. And so uh, there's a possibility that even if they, they held their, their, what they promised earlier that uh, they, they now, they say that they are now different from what they used to be 20 years ago. Given that there's really not, you know, it's, it's kind of a bankrupt country right now and there's really not much money there. Uh, there's a possibility that in fact, a lot of those working in the universities, uh, in government agencies, they won't receive their salaries. And so uh, they will be, of course, because of the, uh, uh, their debt, the preference of Talib, the, the Taliban, they're likely to give the salaries or priorities to those who will be teaching what they actually prefer. And a lot of uh, the impact will be a lot of on women and especially on young girls. Uh, so you cannot never tell right now, but the, their future, it seems to be, will be very bleak. And of course, uh, another concern for a lot of those uh, for, for environmentalists is that uh, the environment and biodiversity will take a hit because of this so far that's that's so far the the situation that we are having for the asia pacific and afghanistan specifically thank you joel that's really interesting um and i'd like to hand over to a very different part of the world um luisa masarani our regional coordinator for latin america and the caribbean over to you luisa Thank you. Uh, good morning. Here is very early in the morning. I'm based in, in Brazil, uh, specifically at uh, in Rio de Janeiro. I would like to share uh, an image with you. So the reason that I want to share is to show that uh, it's actually a lot of uh, people working behind the scenes. So and from different parts of the world. I'm uh, based in Brazil. Zoraida is in Peru. Gabriela in Ecuador. Uh, Daniela in Gabriela in Ecuador, Daniela in Uruguay, Aleida in Mexico, and Alejandro in Costa Rica. As you can see, it's uh, six people from six different uh, parts of uh, the region, which we think that's very important because uh, covering uh, the, uh, the Latin American is so uh, diverse in many senses, culturally, economically, and uh, et cetera, socially. And so we think that's very important to think about uh, uh, science in, in Latin America from different parts of uh, the region. And we also have uh, more than 20 collaborators from almost each country in the, in the region also for, because we also believe that it's very important that people from the country, from the region uh, can, uh, should have voice for talking about uh, science and development because uh, people know better the local context. So uh, as you can see, if you uh, uh, watch the TV news, uh, actually Brazil and also Peru, Mexico, Ecuador are the countries that are really impacted, have been really impacted with COVID. So following what uh, Joel mentioned, uh, we Brazil is particularly in the, in the like the epicenter of the disease with a lot of impacts, a lot of deaths. We have uh, after 17 months of uh, the pandemic uh, hitting us, we have still 1000 pe uh, people dying per day here. And so it's really a tragic thing. And it is basically because of political decision, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. So uh, as you can see, I don't think that uh, the, the, oh yeah. So uh, as you, you can imagine, we cover a lot of uh, political issues, both because of uh, COVID, but actually because we believe that political 
policies and science has everything to do. Uh, many uh, um, news uh, uh, agencies, uh, new journalism uh, uh, website, they do not cover science policy because they don't understand that's so important to, to talk about science policy and politics and uh, politics in general. And inside that, we do cover a lot because we think that's very important. And particularly in the case of COVID, uh, politics has everything to do with uh, with science, with uh, uh, fighting against the disease, and we have a lot of fake news uh, in this region, in every part of the world, a lot of fake news related to the pandemic and to <laughs> uh, different uh, sectors of society, but especially uh, with the pandemic. And uh, in Brazil, we do have a lot of pseudoscience. So this was a story that we covered, uh, we published yesterday, uh, which is about how uh, pseudoscience is actually uh, predominant in the debate on COVID in Twitter, which is very powerful, uh, social network, very power, uh, powerful here in, in, in Latin America, but especially also in Brazil. And as uh, the next talks that we will cover, we, we cover a lot of uh, COVID because obviously it has now a huge impact in our lives, uh, but also because people are so tired, people really want to read about COVID, but uh, <laughs> in the other sense, uh, sense that they are also tired about uh, COVID. So we, we try to cover different topics. So for example, we are preparing right now a video story about the gender difference in physical activities uh, in Latin America, especially among children and adolescents. Uh, this is a, a very wide survey. Uh, the starting point is uh, um, a paper that was uh, published uh, by PLOS One, but uh, systematically we we have uh, the paper as the starting point, but we add other sources and the interviews, etc. And this is a very important topic because uh, in Latin America, uh, there are a lot of uh, poor people around, but also uh, obesity is also uh, an important aspect of this uh, uh, people from uh, low income uh, settings because they eat in a very uh, wrong way. And uh, so it's uh, important that uh, obesity and uh, disease related to obesity are very important at this part of the world. So this is will be um, uh, a news video story. <laughs> and we are also preparing a story about uh, the the footprints, <laughs> uh, the, the, the issue of climate change, footprints, and eating, <laughs> the diet that uh, uh, people have. So it has everything to do with the everyday life of the people. And this is particularly related to Argentina because they, they love big steaks. <laughs> I'm vegetarian myself, but uh, uh, being a carnivorous is very important part of the Argentinian and Uruguay and the South of Brazil. So uh, we, we thought that it would be a very interesting way of linking uh, science, uh, climate change, and the everyday life of the people. So basically, it is what we are preparing for the next few days. And um, I'm here for any further discussion after the, the talks. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you, Louisa. We'll move on to Bothina Osama, and Bothina is our regional coordinator for the Middle East. Over to you, Bothina. Hi, then. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, my name is Bothina Osama, and I'm the regional coordinator of uh, Middle East and North Africa. Um, actually, um, our edition uh, is in Arabic. Uh, as it's mainly targeting the Arabic speaking audiences. Our edition was launch, launched in 2013. So uh, I can say that it's the smallest in the other editions as we, as side of celebrating this year, the 20th anniversary. Uh, we are only eight years old. Uh, our team actually is five, four of them are editorial team and a user engagement coordinator. Uh, we have a network of more than like 40 reporters in almost all the region's countries, which are about like 18 countries. Uh, 
Um, actually, since we started in 2013, our region was on fire with many conflict areas, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, Palestine territories. So one of our focuses in coverage was, uh, and still, um, how science and development are affected by such conflicts and um, from many perspectives, health, environment, um, uh, science, academia, um, all these are covered in our uh, edition. Um, talking about Afghanistan as another conflict area that is added to our hot region, um, actually, as, as Jal presented, it's um, um, actually the situation is still very unclear. Uh, and uh, obviously, the Taliban of 2021 is not the same as 2021. Um, Afghanistan used to have a National Academy of Science, which had around 180 members back in the um, uh, first of uh, 1996. Uh, but after Taliban control in 1996, actually, they um, uh, sent all the professors who teach uh, things other than uh, Islamic studies uh, they released them um, and finished their contracts. So many of them actually immigrated to Pakistan, USA, Europe. And I think the situation, as Jaul um, explained, is almost the same now. Many of them are asking for immigration or immigra immigrated already. Um, although by um, the last few years, uh, they, they started the National Academy again, and they had like 300 members um, who, who are covering natural sciences, social sciences, um, and Islamic studies. Um, so um, as, as Jaul mentioned that the situation of women exactly um, are, are unclear yet. Although there are some uh, of Taliban members are talking about how they will be um, securing women and girls to uh, study uh, in different um, uh, schools and, and, and even the university. But as Jaul explained, the, most of the academia now are, are uh, either immigrating or on the list for immigration. Uh, again, after they um, they are worried about the situation um, now. Um, as I said, there, the National Academy of Sciences of, of Afghanistan has now like 300 members covering natural sciences, Islamic studies, and uh, even social sciences. But the worry is of brain drain again uh, after they secured a number of professors, but um, uh, the situation is still unclear. Uh, so they are all worried. Um, for uh, the women and, and uh, girls uh, education, I think I heard some of the Taliban members in many uh, media, um, media platforms saying that they will leave uh, and secure uh, girls and women to, to uh, keep uh, uh, educating, both in schools and in universities. But as I said, we are not clear enough of the situation, um, how this will, uh, will work. Uh, for the trending uh, other issues in our region, I think uh, COVID, of course, and the head of this, uh, of this particular issues, um, with poor access to vaccination, we are, our region is still struggling in many parts of it, particularly the conflict areas like Syria, Libya, and uh, Palestinian territories, Yemen, uh, still the situation is very worrying. Uh, their access for vaccination is low. And even for the, um, for the health workers who can, can support them with vaccination is also problematic. Um, we are covering this in many stories. Uh, also, um, we are we having, uh, by the end of, of this week, um, uh, an investigative report about the hesitation of health workers in the region uh, towards the COVID vaccines and how this was affecting the ordinary people opinion in uh, vaccination. 
Uh, another uh, hot topic is the Grand Renaissance Dam. Um, as Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia didn't reach an agreement yet on processing the dam or in filling its reservoir. So uh, our last piece was uh, by the end of last week, and it was about uh, a new tool uh, that is depending on uh, satellite imaging for uh, giving more information for the three countries, the researchers in the three countries uh, over which they can depend on, on uh, studying the situation of water flows and, and the effect of uh, the filling of the reservoir dam on the three countries. Uh, it's called Nebras, which actually yeah, an Arabic word that might uh, that mean uh, something that is uh, giving light. Um, also, we have uh, another story this week about the fires in Tunisia and Algeria forests. Uh, it uh, start to um, to have the people there are start to have more control about the fires. So um, we are trying to cover the impacts, how this had impacted specifically the south parts of Tunisia and Algeria. Uh, the deaths were high, were more than hundred deaths because of these fires and many hundreds of of uh, injuries. Um, I think these are the main trending uh, stories that we are working on on MENA edition. Um, that's it from our part. Thank you, Bethina. That was extremely interesting. Back thank you. Back to you, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Ocheng Ogodo, who's our regional coordinator for the East and Southern African region. Over to you, Ocheng. Yeah, uh, uh, thank ben, uh, thanks, Ben, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody um, listening to me um, at this particular point in time. Uh, as Ben has said, I'm, my name is Oichia Mogoda, and I'm the regional coordinator for sub saharan Africa English edition of SciDev.net. I took up the position in 2010, so that's about 11 years down the line, uh, being in charge um, of the region. Uh, I've got a staff of three other people. That is the youth engagement coordinator, the sub-editor, and um, the assistant uh, editor for the region. So that's three. We are, we are four in total, sorry. Um, I work with a network of journalists that span right from Southern Africa to West Africa in places like Nigeria, Ghana, um, Sierra Leone, um, and that's where our coverage is centered on, um, and, and um, when, when I talk about uh, the region itself, what probably are the issues of great concern, I think number one is about agriculture because the region is basically an agricultural area uh, with most of the people involved in agriculture being small holders, um, and therefore agriculture uh, will still be a major issue in the region, uh, especially when we look at the impacts of climate change um, uh, on agriculture. Um, what, it, what will happen, how it's going, it's going to affect people, it's going to affect smallholder farmers who rely on um, agriculture for their own livelihoods and income. So that's the real issue that we have. And um, it said that Africa does very little to contribute to climate change um, uh, caused by human beings, yet has some of the gravest uh, impacts. Uh, like when we had a cyclone that did hit uh, Southern Africa, uh, specifically uh, Mozambique running to Zambia. And it caused several deaths as well as destruction that left so many people uh, in, in a form of destitution. So that is a, a major issue in the region. Uh, we also, I also think that one of the issues that is going to be there for quite a while is the issue of COVID-19. And especially given that the region has got a very weak um, um, health infrastructure, uh, it has got uh, limited human capacity, but it also relies mostly on external funding or external um, donations to do most of the work needed to um, detect and co uh, contain COVID-19. So that is still an area that in a, in a, in a long time 
we may grapple with in the region. Uh, um, but besides uh, that one, there's also the issue of nutrition and food security um, uh, as a major issue in the region. Um, the region is said to be having over 1 billion people in population. So that's really a huge uh, population for the region. And that will require a good amount of food um, uh, and, and investment if people really have to meet their nutritional needs. So that is an issue that uh, will still be a major thing to deal with. And then terms of the long-standing issue of uh, malaria and HIV pre prevention, uh, prevention and uh, uh, treatment. So those are still quite uh, big challenges in the region. Malaria kills so many people in the region. Uh, HIV has been there for quite a long time. And actually it's Sub-Saharan Africa is the epicenter of HIV in uh, Africa as a whole. So that is an issue that will still be quite uh, taxing both at policy level as well as um, uh, 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 private level, uh, sector levels, because the impacts cut across and, and is felt wide. So those are issues that um, are, are very, very pertinent uh, for us. But there is also the issue of instability that uh, uh, scientifically will still affect the region. When you take places like, I mean, for instance, you take Burundi, you take DRC, you take um, Somalia, which is just in the northern part of Kenya, and you take Nigeria with the Boko Haram, those are hotspots and, and there the will still be a quite a, a big uh, issue to deal with uh, in the region. Now, um, on, on the Afg Afghanistan issue that seems to have really taken a census stage in, in world media, um, um, it's not yet very clear how uh, the unfolding events in Afghanistan will impact on Africa, but there's already the fear of probably uh, disruptions. I mean, for instance, uh, in East Africa, there's worry, uh, uh, people are worried about uh, how that happening will uh, feed into uh, Somalia, which has been uh, uh, almost in chaos for so many years. And um, uh, already, I think yesterday, yeah, it was yesterday that uh, following what happened in Afghanistan, in Kenyan coastal town of Mombasa, the special forces did intercept uh, a number of terrorists who had moved into Kenya from Northern Kenya, which is, uh, that is part of Somalia and were uh, armed with a lot of things. So, I mean, the problem is, is that there's the fear of uh, probably Boko Haram uh, getting an impetus from, from what has happened in Afghanistan. There is also the fear of the same thing happening in Mali, uh, in West Africa that has been having uh, a long running insurgency and uh, the government has, all, has been propped up by the French forces and, and this, the, uh, this a possibility they will go away because they are planning to scale down the operations in, in West Africa. And there is also the talk of um, um, Somalia, how they will uh, be re-energized by the fact that after a very long uh, war in Afghanistan, uh, finally, the Taliban have taken over. So that is a major issue that could really impact. I, I mean, and, and for us as a media that deals with sons, uh, such a kind of disruption could easily uh, make institutions not work effectively and properly. Uh, but there's also the fear of resources being diverted, especially the donor resources being diverted from coming in into these institutions to other needs, especially when they want to protect themselves uh, from terrorism. So that is an, um, that's gonna be um, uh, something to really look into. And it's, 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 it's uh, in a long time, we don't know how it's going to play out, but uh, uh, people are really uh, worried. Uh, me specifically, I'm worried about Somalia uh, because it's just our neighbors. And we have had a lot uh, of uh, bombings from Somalia, a lot of deaths, and, and we don't know what's going to happen next uh, when they also feel they should go uh, their 
Taliban way, of course, the Kenyan forces or the Amazon forces, I mean, the UN forces are in Somalia. And um, we don't know how long they will be there. There's a talk of they should withdraw uh, as at now they have been there for quite long. But what next if they do withdraw? Will we see um, another Afghanistan playing out in Somalia? Um, uh, will we see Boko Haram getting more bold and, and going out and, and doing all sorts of bad things that they do uh, in Nigeria? So I think those are issues that we will still grapple with in this part of, uh, um, of Africa. Thanks, Ocheng. That was really interesting. Um, so I'd now like to hand over um, to Julien um, Shongwong. Julien is our uh, regional coordinator for Francophone Africa. He's based in Cameroon. Over to you, Julien. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, everybody. Well, my name is Shongwang Julien. I'm the regional coordinator of the Sub-Saharan Africa French edition of SIDEVNET. I'm based in Douala, the economic capital of Cameroon. So the, the uh, sub Sub-Saharan African French edition team also includes Beatrice Kaze, who is based in Yaoundé, also in Cameroon. She is the assistant editor of the edition. Uh, we also have Vigil Ahisu, who is the audio producer and he is based in Kopenu in Benin. And finally, we have uh, Bilal Tairu, who is the user engagement coordinator and he lives in Dakar in Senegal. So we have a team of four, four, member, four members. So uh, that's it, Sub-Saharan African edition, uh, Sub-Saharan African edition French is the youngest edition of the Sided Net created in, in 2015. So this edition is only six years old. As, as its name suggests, the edition covers the French speaking countries of Africa. It means uh, almost 20 countries from Sub-Saharan Africa, but we can incidentally cover the three countries of North Africa where people also speak French. It means Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. For effective coverage, we also have at least one we, we have at least one correspondent in most of these countries. And as a lot of uh, scientific research relating to French speaking Africa is carried out in Western countries, we also have freelancers in, in certain French speaking countries in the north, such as France and Canada. So that's it. The, the main challenges that we have in our region now is the access to science news. Because you know, there is not a lot of uh, science journal in sub-Saharan African French countries. And the problem is that uh, those that the, 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 the science journal that exists do not communicate enough. And this makes that the journalists are not, the, the journalists from our region are not often a, aware of studies and researches carried out by local research institutions. And when journalists come out to know about these studies, their authors are not always open to the press and they are not always available to answer questions about their studies. Therefore, to produce article, we uh, generally rely on uh, most of the time on studies published by international science journal based in Western countries, provided that these studies are relevant for Sub-Saharan Africa French countries. The, however, there is a lot of hope uh, in the air. In fact, with COVID-19, interactions between authorities involved in science and, and scientists on one side and journalists on the other side were highly improved thanks to frequent press conferences organized by authorities to inform about the evolution of the pandemic in each country in the region. So we hope that even after the pandemic, this contact will be kept. It will be very, very useful for the development of science uh, journalism in Sub-Saharan Africa, French region. The other reason for this hope is that there are more and more journalists in Francophone countries, the Francophone Sub-Saharan uh, African countries, who are interested in science news. Therefore, 
there has been a creation of a network of French speaking African journalists after the World Conference of Science Journalists in 2019 that was held in Lausanne in Switzerland. And there is also uh, in associations that have been uh, association of science journalists that have been created in some countries, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire. Another reason of this hope is, is that in Burkina Faso recently, the government has put in place and that was on 20th of, of August, so just four days ago, they, the government put in place an interministerial committee whose role is to popularize the result, the result of science research conducted in this Western Afri West African country. So we think that science journalists in this country will have a better access to science information from now on. Uh, this popularization of the research result in Burkina Faso is one of the most powerful story that we are planning to publish in the coming days as our correspondent, our correspondent is, in this country is already working in order to deliver his article soon. And our, our intention is to uh, embed an interview, uh, a video interview in this, in this story with the president of this interministerial committee. Apart from that, we are also working on a story related to COVID-19 vaccine that is tending to become mandatory in some uh, countries of the region, for example, in Guinea and even in Gabon. So, uh, and that is a decision that human rights defenders are contesting. So um, I'm going to stop here and there is an overview of how things are going in SIDEF-NET francophone edition. Thank you for listening. I'm available to answer any question. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, everybody. So I'd just like to say, finally, thank you very much for joining us on this first of our readers conference calls. Um, I hope that we hope that you found it informative. We also hope that you'll consider subscribing to SIDEVNet Plus, our new membership service. So thank you for joining and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.